difficult. I think what we'll probably do then is, and I'm trying to respect social distancing, um, we might have to break into two groups depending on our size, or we can have the youth when the pastor's office meet in the prayer room is probably my first goal. So just uh, recognize next Wednesday, if we're not going to be in here. We're probably going to be in the prayer room or one of the four years in two separate groups. Okay. Um, just doing the best that we can with um, keeping people uh, spread out and stuff. And another, um, Another uh, question I had just for feedback for me, how many enjoy um, on Wednesday nights when we have the small groups? Do, do people like that or don't like that? Do, do, you, do you like to break into small groups? And I've had a couple of people tell me, hey, when are we going to do small groups again? Now, you know, in April we have first two weeks uh, on Wednesday night, Sherry speaking, the second two, Linda, right? Or is it flip-flop? You're first, she's second. You're the second two weeks. So April, um, we're, we're covered with a special lady guests here, and, and uh, we'll be speaking to you in April. In May, our goal is to be in the pavilion, okay, through, throughout summer. But then fall is when we would think about uh, kicking off a small, these small groups like we did before. Of course, that all has to do with social distancing and space and everything else. But does anybody enjoy the small groups? Um, one, two, three, a few of you do? So, yeah, so. Yeah, so, I mean, some do, some don't. They're like, yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Okay. All right, that helps me. So I'm not sure what to do. All right, it's all good. Okay, so for tonight's um, uh, study that we're going to do, so I, I want to uh, kind of still hit on what we were talking about Sunday um, and then bounce off of that onto a new thought process or little subject that I want to cover. And um, uh, next Wednesday, I told Pastor, I was emailing him today, um, I'm not sure what day he gets back here, Monday or Tuesday, but I told him if he needs to go see his father, don't, you know, just get, to Pens get up to Pennsylvania there with his dad. So um, if, if I do next Wednesday, we will um, continue the same subject that we're going to do tonight um, as well. But um, I, I did mention that to him t to head up there as soon as he gets back. So uh, but tonight we're in 1 Kings um, 21, 1 through 5, and I want to talk about uh, Naboth. And, and how um, you know, his lamb was taken from him and then kind of bounce off of that onto our, our new um, uh, subject that we're going to talk about. So let's look at 1 Kings um, 21, and I'll, I'll read it here to you. You can read along with me. I think they have it all on the screen too. So talk about Naboth's uh, vineyard. So there was a man named Naboth from Jezreel who owned a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. So uh, Jezreel is uh, a beautiful area, uh, the Jezreel Valley, which is also known as the Valley of Megiddo, okay? Beautiful, green, lush flowers, just gorgeous. Uh, I was, in fact, if you don't want to listen to me, Google uh, Valley of Megiddo and, and hit images on your Google and there's beautiful pictures. Um, so Valley of Megiddo, a valley of Jezreel, is also the valley of Armageddon. So that is the valley where the battle of Armageddon will take place. And it's a very fertile land. It's a beautiful, beautiful view. We've stood there as we go on the tour over there and just look down through there. It's this gorgeous. Um, what I think is cool is there's an airport down in that valley. It's shaped like a V, and the name of the airport is, I think you pronounce it, Ramat, R-A-M-A-T, David Israeli Air Base. And what's cool about that airport is they actually stick the aircraft underground. And so instead of having hangars, you know, up on the top like we do here in the U.S., they actually put them down on the ground, bring them up on an elevator, and then they, they take off from the runway. So do you remember that, Paul? It really, really cool. But that is the place of the Armageddon. So that's where, that's where you're at in your mind talking right now. So you have the king's palace up on the mountain, and close to or touching the property is uh, Naboth's property there. And it's beautiful. He has a beautiful vineyard. And, of course, so King Ahab sells, well, I want that, right? Um, whether he's looking at or is touching his property, he says, hey, I, I really want that piece of property. It's beautiful. So one day, Ahab went down to Naboth to visit him. In verse 2, since your visit vineyard is so convenient to my palace, I would like to buy it and use it as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I'll even just pay you for it. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down to my ancestors. 
So Ahab went home angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face against the wall and refused to eat. That is the sulking and the pouting Nahab, or King Ahab that we talked about Sunday. And so here comes his wife, Jezebel, and she says, what's the matter? And he, she said, what's made you so upset that you're not eating? I asked Naboth to sell me the vineyard or trader, and he refused to sell it to me, Ahab said. And she's like, are you not the king of Israel, Jezebel demanded? Get up and eat something and don't you worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. Remember I said she was the gruff lady? Okay, if you weren't here Sunday, you probably think I'm a nut. But Okay, so she wrote letters, and Jezebel wrote letters in Ahab's name, took his king's seal and sealed them and sent them to the elders and the other leaders of the town there uh, where Naboth lived. In her letter, she commanded, I want you to call the citizens together for fasting and prayer, and give Naboth a place of honor, then seat two scoundrels across from him who will accuse him of cursing God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and other town leaders followed the instructions of Je Jezebel and that she had written in the letter. They called for a fast and put Naboth at a prominent place before the king, or before the people. Then the two scoundrels came and sat down across from him and they accused Naboth before all the people saying, he cursed God and the king. So he was dragged outside town, stoned to death. The town leaders then sent word to Jezebel Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, You know the vineyard you wanted, Naboth, wouldn't sell you? Well, you can have it. Now he's dead. So we have here, Ahab goes to Naboth and says, Hey, want to buy your vineyard? And Naboth's like, not for sale. And he's like, want to buy your vineyard? He's like, read my lips, not for sale. Okay? And so... Nahab is really a true follower of the Lord. And you can see that in verse 3. He says, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. He's refusing the king to his face. And, you know, I just want to pull something out here. You know, wicked acts that people do, do not go unseen by God. You know, I, I just want you, the little take home here. You know, when people do wicked acts, it, they don't go unseen by God. God sees every injustice, and God makes every injustice right. Maybe it's in your lifetime that you'll see it, maybe it's not. And you know, uh, things can happen, terrible things can happen to us in our lives, and you know, we may say, how can God let this go on? But listen, he does not let it go unnoted he just he doesn't and in Exodus 34 it says that he does not let the guilty go unpunished in Deuteronomy 32 it says that he will avenge the blood of his servants in Romans 12 it talks about vengeance is mine I will repay it does not escape God's eye he settles every score in his own timing so now why is it that Naboth will not sell the land, period. Does anybody know? Why is it? What's the big deal? Right. So Naboth is a man of conviction, a man of character, a man of principle. He's, he's standing up to, to what's going on in, in society in his time with the wickedness and the, and the adultery. And in verse 15, you know, we see there very clearly uh, when Jezebel heard the news, she, she said to Ava, you, you know the vineyard that you wanted that he wouldn't sell you? Well, now you can have it, you know, because she lived by uh, and believed the fact that, you know, kings and queens can rightfully have or do anything that they wanted. I mean, clearly you can see that she lived by that. And, you know, there are people today, maybe <laughs> politicians or people who think that they're above the law or above rules or laws and boundaries. They just do whatever they think they can do and, and say, and, and, you know, there's nothing around that. So you really see that uh, spewing out of her life during this time. But, you know, this land for Naboth was, you know, number one, people farmed back in that day. Right, so so farming and having land was was their livelihood. Um, it was it was income, but you know the land, as somebody said, was his inheritance. It was the inheritance of his fathers. It was the signature of God 
on the covenant people of Israel. Remember, they said that I will give you this land to, and to your, de- your descendants, take you to the land flowing with milk and honey. And it was a gift of God. It was that important that this was God's gift to them of the land, right? And, and uh, Naboth knew the Mosaic law in Leviticus 25. It talks about never sell your property. There, there's an exception that you can sell your property if you're in a very bad state of finances, but it's supposed to be sold to a relative so that you can purchase it back as soon as possible, right? That was, the, that was of the Mosaic law. In no, Numbers 36, it talks about no inheritance is to pass from tribe to tribe. Every Israelite will keep the land that's inherited to their forefathers. And you see, Naboth is a godly man here that's a, having this culture against him, and he's really standing his ground. And, and um, you know, and for a reason that because of his beliefs in Christ and what God has told him in his inheritance. And so he knew the commands and he was honoring God with what he had. And so I want to just take that little bit of thinking, you know, uh, the, the inheritance and what God has given them and, and, and knock off of that for something I want to uh, talk about this week. And, and that is, you know, our, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Rolling over to New Testament and new thinking. So uh, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So uh, what is a valuable piece of real estate that we have all been given that we need to take great care of? Our minds. Okay? So I want to start talking and thinking about our minds, our thoughts, our thinking process. Okay? Okay? Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our lives are always moving in the directions of our strongest thoughts. What we think shapes who we become. And so I was going through my emails today, and has anybody here ever heard of Jimmy Evans? Uh, he's common now for tipping point. And so I got an email today from him, and he's talking about deception in the last days. And so I just wanted to take this opportunity. If you've not heard of him, you'll, you'll see him here. Uh, Pastor Pete's going to cue that up. It's about 12, 13 minutes long. So if you don't mind, I'd really like you just to see this because there's no sense in me trying to say what he's going to say. You might as well just listen to him as I want you to begin to think about um, how to protect your mind from the deception of the devil and think about what you're thinking about. Start to think about how you think and how you process things. Okay? So, uh, Pastor Pete, if you're ready, you can go ahead and kick that. We, we prote- protect ourselves against, against deception and stand, and stand in, truth in truth in these in end these times. End times. I, want say, I want to another say another thing, another thing as I teach this, teach this segment, and that is, and that is there, 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 there are two there are goals, goals that I have in the Tipping Point Show. show. The first, the first is, to is to help you understand the end times. The second, the is, second to is to help you live in the end times. I don't want, I don't these, want programs these programs to only, to tell, only you tell you fascinating, fascinating things about the end times, the end times that, that maybe you don't know. I want that, I want to, that happen. to happen. I also, I also want, want to pastor you, you through the end through times. The end a, lot times. Of a lot of people right now are living fear, in fear, anxiety, anxiety confusion, confusion, all different, all types, different, of different types, types of things. things. And, and we all know, we all know every, single every single one of us know, we are in a spiritual warfare like never before. I have never seen a world like this. I never dreamed that I would live in a world like this and my children and grandchildren would live in a world like this. But we're overcomers. And we will overcome until Jesus returns. And that's one of the main reasons that we have in times the tipping, the tipping point, point show, and all of and that. All of we that. We want it to equip you to stand, to stand and, to and to overcome in these end, in these end times. times. But we have to understand the warfare, the warfare that we're fighting is mainly, is mainly a warfare, warfare of, our of our minds. The, 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 battle, the of battle of thoughts. thoughts. In other words, Second Corinthians, Corinthians 10, 10, I talked about, I talked this, about this last week. Let me just remind you, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every, and every high, high thing, thing that exalts itself, exalts itself against, against the knowledge of God, of God bringing, bringing every, every thought into captivity, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Satan so wars against, against us with thoughts. With thoughts. That's, what That's what he did with Adam, Adam and Eve in the Garden, in the Garden of, of Eden. Eden. He, he took, he took mankind, mankind hostage, hostage with just a, with few, just a simple few simple thoughts, thoughts that were deceptive. 
uh, and I'm going to and I'm going to talk in, in the next program, program now about why why why, why is the devil so, so effective in what he does? What he does. There's, There's a secret of why, of why he is so effective. When you understand the secret, you can beat him every single time. But I'm going to talk about, about that, about that in, the next show. in the next show. But but the the warfare. warfare this, is the this is the battlefield right here. Right here. It's, a battlefield it's a battlefield of our mind, and the word, and the word of God is the weapon that God has given us to win every battle. The word of God, Ephesians six says, is a sword of the spirit. Hebrews four says. Says the word of God, God, is, God living. is living. It's alive. It's alive. It's sharper, it's sharper than, than any two-edged two sword. sword. And so, and the, so word the word of God, God Jesus, Jesus defeated, defeated Satan, Satan himself, himself with, three with three scriptures. That's all. It That's took. all it took. And so, I and so, I want to talk to you now about, about the, the the process of taking, of taking your, thoughts your thoughts captive and winning every, every war because, because we, all we all know we are in a battle, battle for, our for our thoughts, for our minds. For our minds. I heard, a I heard two, a, two stories. One is, One is a, a gentleman, told gentleman told me that his two sons, two sons graduated, graduated from high school, school wanted to go into the ministry. Into the ministry. Uh, both uh, both went, to went to college first. first. One, of One of them came out of college and said, I no longer have faith in Christ. I have no faith at all. And the parents began to ask him, what happened to your faith? He said, when I, went when, I college, college, when I went to college, I went to university, public, public university, university, he said, my, my professors, professors hounded every Christian, every Christian in, the in the class and persecuted us every time, every time we mentioned the Lord or for our beliefs and our faith. And he said, the process, the process of, that of that for four years, four years destroyed, destroyed my faith. My faith. Heard, another Heard another story last weekend about a couple, about a couple that, that I knew very well. They went to they the, went church, to the church, that church that I pastored for many years. Many years. And, someone and someone was telling, someone was me, telling me they were out of church. And I said, what happened? They said, their son, their high school, their high school son, son told them he didn't believe, he didn't believe in, Jesus, in Jesus and he was tired and he of hearing about Jesus. about Jesus. A boy that grew up in church. Uh, and with social media, television, television, movies, the internet are just so filled with this anti-Christ, anti-word sentiment that you have to be strong in your faith to survive in these times. So we first of all have to understand that we have to take our thoughts captive. And we have to make those thoughts submit themselves to the Word of God. If this is not the supreme authority in your life, you're not going to stand in the end times. In fact, the Second Thessalonians 2 says the reason that they were deceived is they did not receive the love, the love of, the truth, of the truth so as, so to, be as to be saved. The word love there is a God. It is God's, it is God's kind, of kind of love. It is the, it is the most, most committed, committed love on the earth. On the earth. They did, are, they did, you are you dating, dating this? this? Are you, are you engaged to this? To this? Or are you married, you married to this? To this? That's, the That's the question. And a lot of people, lot of people are just smooching around, smooching around on the Word of God. God. They, they, have, have, they no have no allegiance to it. To it. And when it comes and down, down to being persecuted, being persecuted for, their faith, for their faith, or you know, or, you know being uh, shamed, uh, shamed for, their faith, for their faith, they give up they on the Word. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words, in this evil and adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of you when I come with my Father and my Father and His angels. And so in His glory. So this is something that we need to understand is, is that this is a time, is a time that, we that we cannot be ashamed of the Word of God. We have to fight the Word of God. Let me read you, Let me read you a scripture, and this is from Psalm chapter 1, because this is the process. It's biblical, biblical meditation. It's very it's simple, very but, simple very but very powerful in overcoming, in overcoming every, battle every battle you'll ever fight for your thoughts. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Blessed, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the, is law, in the of the law of the Lord, and in his and law, in his he, law meditates he meditates day and night. He shall be, he shall like, be a like a tree planted by the, by the rivers, of waters, rivers of waters that brings, that brings forth, forth its fruit in its season, season whose leaf also, also shall not wither. Not wither. Listen, and whatever, and whatever he, does he does will prosper. Will prosper. Blessed, is, Blessed the is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or stand the path of sinners, sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of God, and in it he meditates day and night. I'm going to teach you in this message how to meditate the Word of God day and night. I'm telling you, it's simple. It's simpler than any other way you've ever lived before. It's simple. Anyone can do it. It's not difficult. It doesn't mean you're super religious or anything like that. It just means this is the way that God told us to live our lives. And so notice there it says, Everything, everything he, does, he does, does will prosper. Let me explain, Let me explain something. something to you. We have hardware. We have hardware. Our brains, our brains, and and our, brains our brains are phenomenal. Are phenomenal. God, designed God designed the human the brain. There'll never be a person that, that invents, invents, a invents a computer as good as, as, good as this computer is right, right here. Because this, because this, com this we're is we're made in the image of God. Our brains, our brains are, incredible, are incredible, but we have a software problem. problem. In, the garden in the Garden of Eden, our software got infected. And now we have a corrupted mind. This is, this the, is software. the software to understand, to understand the, the, pro the importance, the importance of, the of the Word of God. This is, this the, is software the software that this that hardware, this hardware was, designed was designed to run on. 
And the process, and the process of, reading of reading the Bible, the Bible and, meditating and meditating on it is a process of downloading, of downloading new software. New software. If you, do if you do marriage the way God, the way God designed, designed it, it will succeed. If you do if you money the way God designed it, you will succeed. If you do, if you do relationships the way God designed them, them, you will succeed. Everything, Everything you do will succeed if you do, if you do it according, according to the Word of God. And I know because I've lived both ways. I lived I live my early life as a non-believer, didn't know any of the Word of God. I've lived for the last 40 years as a believer, understanding more and more of the Word of God. And the more that my thoughts get in line with the Word of God, and the more, and the I, do more I do things according to the Word of God, the, the, more, I the more I prosper. In fact, everything, everything prospers when you do it when you according, do it according to the Word of God. Let me talk so about, let me talk about so, this. So, so in meditating, in meditating on the Word of God, the word meditate there means ruminate. It means, it means that, that you, you take, it down, take it down, you bring it up, you bring it up, you take it, you take down, it down, you bring it up. This is like a cow that swallows grass. Regurgitates, regurgitates it, swallows it again. It's a process, a process of purifying until finally, till finally it's, digested. it's digested. And so, and so you, put you put scripture in your mind. In your mind. You, get up in you get up in the morning, you put scripture, you put scripture in, your mind, in your mind, a text or whatever. Or whatever. And, that and that scripture is available, is available now, now for you to bring, you to bring up during the day. Or there or can be there other scripture. So in other words, let's just say, let's talk about lust for just a minute. Because I have a friend of mine. Because this book is mindset free. Everything I'm teaching is in this little book that are mindset free. It's available on XO now or XOMarriage.com or Amazon. But this is a book about biblical meditation. Well, when I teach men about how to overcome lust and pornography, this is what I teach. Biblical meditation. Is biblical meditation. It's the only answer. It's the only way you'll ever defeat lust. It's your biblical, it's your biblical meditation. meditation. That's, That's worry, anxiety, anxiety fear, fear, right on down, right on down the line. So, so um, I, had I had a friend of mine who is the most disciplined, disciplined human being I've ever, I've ever known in my entire life. He was ex army, army graduated, graduated from West Point. From West Point. I, went to I went to church with him. He moved away to another community. And he called me one day. This has been 20 years ago. And he called me one day and said, Jimmy, I need to come see you. And I said, Great. So he flew all the way where I was. And we sat down. And we sat down. And I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine you know, why he would go all of that trouble of coming, of coming to see me. And he said, and he said I am absolutely, absolutely in bondage to pornography, to pornography and there's nothing, and there's nothing I, can I can do about it. About it. And, I, and I talked with him, talked with him for a little while and he told me his story. And frankly, I honestly couldn't believe it because I just couldn't imagine that this guy, anything could beat this guy. But it had. But it had. He was completely defeated. And I taught him, and I about, taught him biblical about biblical meditation. meditation. I just told him, I said, him, I said you, you, have to you have to take your thoughts, your thoughts captive, captive and, you have, and you have to have a scripture to replace, to replace your bad, bad thoughts with. Listen, 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 the devil's thoughts are more powerful than your thoughts. Than your thoughts. And if you, and if try, you to try to fight the devil with your, with your own thoughts, he's going to beat you every time. But the word, but the word of God, God is more powerful than the devil's than thoughts. Let me just use Psalm 1 as an example. So you're, so you're, you're, you're being tempted, being tempted. You're being tempted, you're being tempted to you know, you know, lust or fear or worry or whatever it is. In the Bible, in the Bible you, go read, you go read, make this a make practical, practical book. book. Are, you Are you struggling with fear? Second Timothy 1.7 says, says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, but of love and power and sound, sound mind. By the way, one of the things that this book does, the mindset free, is it the back, is it the back of the book, book it has scriptures for you to meditate on. It gives you, it gives you if you're going, whatever you're going through, it gives you scriptures to meditate on. And so this says, lust and immorality, Psalm 101, 1 Corinthians 6, Proverbs 5, Proverbs 6, worry and anxiety, Philippians 4, Matthew 6. Matthew 11, fear, fear anger, anger, unforgiveness, discouragement, all those kinds, all those kinds of things, things like condemnation, insecurity, insecurity marriage problems, pride, problems, financial, pride, financial issues. issues. It gives you, it gives specific, you specific scriptures to go to, to, to meditate on. And so here's the point. So you're, so you're being tempted. Being tempted you're, 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 battling, you're battling. In all of a sudden, all of a sudden these thoughts, these thoughts are, in are in your mind. And you're thinking, and you're thinking yourself, to yourself, I need to get, I need that, get thought that thought out of your mind. You can't. You can't take thoughts out of your mind. You can only replace them with greater thoughts. And so, and so this friend, this friend of mine who came to see me because he, he was battling lust, lust, I told him how to meditate, meditate, on, meditate on Scripture, very simply. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, so let me read so your Scripture. This is Deuteronomy 6. These words, These words which, which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children as you talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and uh, they, shall they shall be as frontless between your eyes. eyes. You, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And on your so, gates. so what God, God was telling the children of Israel is you put this word in front of you. Okay. Okay. And he tells, and he the, tells children the children of Israel four times during the day, 
I want I you, want to, you teach to teach this to your, this children. To your children. When is it? When is it? When they go to, when bed, they go to bed at night. When they wake, when up, they wake in morning, up in the morning. When they're sitting, when they're around, sitting the house, around the house. And when you're on, when your, you're way on your way somewhere. Did you know that those, you know are, the that those are the four most contemplative, contemplative times of the day that you're going to struggle, gonna struggle the most with your thoughts, with your thoughts if you don't have if something to put in there that's positive? When it says you meditate on the Word of God day and night, I never struggle when I'm working. When I'm busy, when I'm, busy, when I'm, working, when I'm, I'm working, I'm sitting here right now teaching you, teaching you never, never struggle. struggle. Never struggle, never with, struggle with my thought life. It's when I'm laying, when I'm laying in bed at night. At contemplating. At contemplating. So I'm, so I'm laying, laying, awake, laying in awake in the morning before I get up. Before I get up. Contemplating. That's why I'm sitting, sitting around the house not doing anything. Contemplating. It's when, when you're in your car or you're in an airplane or something like that. And your thoughts are wandering, whatever. That's when the devil attacks. And God said, be ready with the word of God at that time. And so when you're sitting around contemplating and the devil begins to attack your thoughts, you have, you to, have, have to have the word. You have to have, have a scripture, or a, or a text of scripture, of scripture that you can that you can meditate on. on. One, One of my favorite scriptures when I when I feel like I'm being under attack or something. Hebrews thirteen, Hebrews 13 five, five says the Lord, the Lord says, says I will never, I will leave, never you. leave you. I will never, I will forsake, never forsake you. you. Therefore, Therefore, you can you boldly, can boldly say, the Lord, say, the Lord is, my is my helper. I will, I will not, not fear. What can, what can a man do to me? I love, me? That, I love scripture. that scripture. And I'll sit, and there, I'll sit there sometimes at night. I'm laying in bed. I just feel like I'm you know, kind of under siege. I'm being attacked, I'm being attacked, or, attacked or, something. or something. And I'll sit and I'll there, there and I'll quote that a hundred times. It brings, it brings peace. It brings it brings the presence, the presence of, God. of God. It, it just, it just everything, everything changes. changes. But I have, but I to, have to have the sword of the spirit. I have I to have, to have the, thoughts the thoughts of God in my mind. In my mind. And, what and what happens is, my friend. Let me finish the story about my friend who came to see me. He came to see me. He came to see me. I taught him about meditation. Meditation. I said, when in your meditative times during the day, you're going to you're going to be attacked. And in, those and in times, those times, get scripture, get scripture ready. ready. Just, just get, get a text, get a text scripture of scripture ready to meditate, ready to meditate on. on. And rather than, and rather sitting, than sitting there and wrestling, wrestling with, your with your thoughts, replace, replace it with scripture and sit there and, and, sit there and meditate, on scripture. meditate on scripture. Just, just take, it down, take it down, bring it up, bring it up, take it down, bring it up. Just keep, just keep ruminating, ruminating on it for as long, for as, long as you need to. My friend called me three or four days later and he said, I answered the telephone and I said, hello, and he said, I'm free. I'm free. And I said, and what? I said he what? He said, I'm completely, 100 percent free. free. And I said, and well, I said, well, praise God. He said, no, he Jimmy, said, no, Jimmy I'm, telling I'm telling you. He said, I he said, got, got on the airplane, on the airplane to fly home, and I was and free I was when, free when I sat on that airplane because immediately, because immediately I was tempted, and immediately, and immediately I, began I began to meditate, to meditate on, scripture. on scripture. He said, I cannot I believe it is that easy. He said, he said, also can't believe it's that powerful. Okay, so. His book, I've not yet read, but I will eventually read that book. Um, I was taking this from a different book Pastor Peter put up there um, that's very similar to what he's talking about. This is um, Craig Groeschel. Now, has anybody heard of Craig Groeschel? A couple of you? Okay. Um, good podcast and different stuff. So he has a new book out called Winning the War in Your Mind. Um, change your thinking and change your life. And it's really parallel exactly to what he's talking about here. But I can tell by the size of Jimmy Evans's book is about a quarter this size. And having read about a quarter of this book, um, this book really takes you back to square one, explains science and biblical parallels and just walks you through, let me help you understand why you're thinking, how you're thinking, so we can go back to square one and work all the way through to replace thoughts with scripture, okay? Um, so it, this, I mean, good, I'd recommend it, okay? Um, and I'll eventually read that book as well. Just got to get through a bunch of other stuff. Um, so as, as we're going through here now, um, you know, the Valley of Megiddo, the Battle of Armageddon, the Battle of Our Minds, the property that Naboth didn't want to release, same in the property you don't want to release to bad thoughts is our mind, okay? And so uh, I really appreciate what he said there is you can't take a thought out, you can only replace a thought. You can't remove a thought, you have to replace the thought, right? So what we think will shape who we become. In Philippians 4, verse, uh, verses 8 and 9, it says, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is true, authentic, and real. Keep your thoughts, thick, your thoughts fixed on things that are honorable, admirable, beautiful, and respectful, pure, and holy, merciful, and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God. 
praising him always. Put into practice the example of all that you have heard from me or seen in my life, and the God of peace will be with you in all things. Now, Paul is moving here from thought, okay? Think about such things, okay? So Paul takes you to a, from a thought, you're thinking about such things, to the next is an action, putting it into practice, and then third, experience, experiencing the peace that will be with you, experience what that thought takes out. Now, if you're here tonight and you're thinking, well, I don't have bad thoughts, I don't have a problem thinking, ask your spouse, okay? They'll help you. Or your best friend, okay? Because we all have thoughts that can be corrected or better, right? I mean, I hope all of you are always trying to grow yourself into a better place. And, you know, it's recommended that everybody reads something for 15 minutes a day. Now, I'm talking on top of your daily devotion, prayer time, Bible reading, pray, worship, on top of that, it's recommended that you read something for 15 minutes a day minimum. So I always have a book, and I'm not a guy that can read three books at once. i got to do one, finish it, and then take the next one. I know some of you have like seven books you're reading. I don't know how you do that. There's, you know, on your nightstand and on your, I mean, I can't. Like, I'm a one-book guy. i got to start it, got to finish it. But anyhow, so just, you know, always trying to grow ourselves, always trying to grab our thoughts, Okay, put it into practice, make an action, and then experiencing what that does for us. Our thoughts shape our lives. The thoughts you think shape your lives. So, you know, a lot of times we were always like the power of the spoken word, right? You hear that often, man. What you speak is powerful. But if we take a step back, even before we speak it, how about our thoughts? How powerful are our thoughts? Now, a lot of times, how many don't think before they speak? Guilty, right? So, but if you back up one, you should think before you speak. So how much more powerful would our thoughts be if we can capture that before we even speak? So let's think about what we're thinking about. Okay? Now, I want you to, to take you through this little exercise here that he has and. Um, what he's talking about is two different categories to think about. A defense category, and I'm going to ask you questions, okay? And then an offense category. The defense category is protection from the enemy. The offense category is growth towards God, okay? Questions that you might reg regularly think. For example, okay, um, a defense, a protection from the enemy might be this. Are my thoughts tearing me down and, and you really have to stop and think what am I thinking about throughout the day how often do you have to coach yourself otherwise because you're trying to constantly pick yourself back up to make it through the day okay so an offensive or a defense protection from the enemy thought would be are my thoughts tearing me down where on the offense growth towards God are my thoughts building me up. Growth thoughts, growth towards God, do I think peaceful thoughts? Or am I constantly thinking worried thoughts? Protection from the enemy, does my self-talk cause me to shrink back? Or my thought that helps me grow towards God, does my self-talk inspire me to take faith risks. My growth thought might be, do my thoughts help me to get closer to others? Or my thought protecting me from the enemy might be, do my thoughts cause me to keep people at a distance? You have to think when you're reading this book, thinking about your thoughts. Okay? Protection from the enemy thoughts, are my unhealthy thoughts keeping me from the life I want? Or my growth toward God thoughts, do my thoughts reflect my faith? Growth toward God thought, are my thoughts God honoring? Or protection from the enemy thoughts, are my unhealthy thoughts keeping me from the life God wants for me. 
or my unhealthy thoughts keeping me from the life God wants for me. A protection from the enemy thought of my thoughts negative, toxic, or self-depreciating. My growth toward God thoughts. Do my thoughts reflect my hope in Christ? A growth toward God thought. Do they inspire me to believe I can make a difference in the world? Or my protection from the enemy thought, does my inner voice tell me I'm helpless or that life is hopeless? Protection from the enemy thought, do I find myself skeptical of others? My growth toward God thought, do they equip me to become more like Jesus? Growth toward God thought. Do my thoughts connect to the vision God has for my life? Or protection from the enemy thought. Do I lean toward imagining worst case scenarios? The life you have is a reflection of the thoughts that you think. The life you have is a reflection of the thoughts that you're thinking. For example, you can have two people in the same exact situation. One is miserable for what they have. The other person is grateful what they have. Same situation, but a totally different mindset. Proverbs 23 tells us, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So if my life is moving me in the direction of my strongest thought, then ask yourself, do you like the direction your life is going? With God's help, you can transform your mind. You can stop believing the lies that hold you back. You can end the vicious cycle of thoughts that are destructive to you and to others. And you can allow God to renew your mind by saturating you with his unchanging truth. You can let his thoughts become your thoughts. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What we think will shape who we become. So he talks about the, the first principle as a replacement principle, removing the lies and replacing them with truth. So you define their thought. That thought's not really true. And you replace it with the truth. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I wonder if you feel locked up or taken captive. If so, you consider that you might be trapped in a self-made prison. You may feel held back from living life, living the life that you want to live not experiencing the relationship that you want with God. With little to no hope for the future, but are you? If you think you're trapped, if you believe there's a lock on the door, then you've bought it into a lie. And it is the lie, nothing else, that is holding you back. Yet if you identify the lie, then you can remove it. You can replace it with the truth and be free. Identify the lie, Replace it with the truth and be set free. So there's a two-step process, the liberation process. And there's number one, remove the lie. And you're going to replace it then with the truth. But the struggle in this process is very real and it is very hard. And it can feel like a war is being fought in your life because that's exactly what is happening. Now, you cannot defeat 
what is not defined. You cannot defeat what is not defined. For example, our son Marcus races motocross bikes. And so it's worse than an airplane. You ride it in an hour, you work on it five hours. I mean, you just beat the living daylights out of them. They're always broke. And so when you, you have to troubleshoot, define the problem to fix it, right? So the last issue that we was having was after it warmed up about 15 minutes and you're riding it, it bogs down. It just it loses power. And so this is a, a KTM if you're into to motorcycles. It's a, I think it's Australian made. Um, and, and parts are almost like airplane expensive parts. So you just don't go and buy something and throw it on there to see if that fixes it. You've got to define the problem so you can fix the problem. You've got to get to the issue. So, you know, engines are air, fuel, and spark. Okay, so if the engine is bogging down after it warms up, either there's an air problem, so let's say, for example, a valve that's not closing all the way, you have an intake valve and an exhaust valve, so maybe the intake valve is not closing all the way, okay? That can be created by the air filter sucking dust in, putting a streamline of dust across there, and it literally sandblasts the valve, and now the valve isn't closing all the way, so it's not breathing correctly, so it, it breaks down, okay? It could be something in the fuel system, so that means it could be fuel filters, fuel pump, fuel pressure, electronic sensors to the throttle position, it could be electronically. I mean, it could be um, spark. It could be a spark plug. It could be in a, the exciter, the module. I mean, you, uh, right? I mean, you can go on all day long. Which one is it? You, you've got to define the thought. You've got to grab this thought that keeps going through your mind. Think about what you're thinking about. Pull it out. Write it down. And then as, as, as Jimmy said, you have to get the thought. What is it in your heart? What scripture is it that motivates that can be replaced with that lie that you're believing? And now there's a battle taking place because every time that thought comes out, you need to replace it with the scripture. And as I was putting this together, I couldn't help to think when I, when I personally went through a very low time of my life, I constantly every day I have a tablet still have it today and I wrote scriptures and sayings that lifted me up when I lost a six-digit job flying corporate jets every day is a vacation every day is a Saturday and you know just every, the world came crashing down it was in a very low place and I did take months and months and months and I wrote every day scriptures and sayings and things that lift myself back up over and over and again. I can tell you, uh, Miss Linda does this with healing scriptures. I know she's done it because she shared a book with my dad and different scriptures, stuff like that. You, you have a healing that you're looking for. You're telling your mind. You're not, you're not lying to yourself saying, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. Clearly, you got something going on. You know, those people that say, I'm not sick. <coughs> I'm not sick at all. Okay, Let, let's define that you're sick, Right? Now let's find some scriptures to replace it with truth, with God's power, with God's word. And so I'm going to constantly take the truth and I'm going to put it in place of the lie, put it in place of the issue in my life of that thought pattern. And you get better and better and better and better. And the guy on the airplane sat down and said, I'm healed 100%. It works. It works. I'm done 100%. And so what's that guy going to do next? He's probably going to define another thought pattern that's not healthy and he's going to start working on another one. But wouldn't your spouse love if you did this all the time and it worked? Right? I mean, what, what goes on home is like they see behind, right? I mean, like what's at home is the real stuff. And what you see up here is, I'm not going to say it's fake, but you see the good me, right? You don't see the number of times I blow my top off and, you know, ah, you know. You do see it a little bit, right? But you have, you cannot defeat what is not defined. So he gives, uh, Craig Groeschel calls it a rut in a trench. Okay? A rut, by definition, is typically formed in mud 
and it becomes a nuisance, even a danger. A rut is unintentionally created, has no purpose, but requires repaired. You know, if you're going to, you want to park close to your house in the snow and the rain, and you just you want to park close to your house, you want to park close to your house. Now you have ruts in your yard, right? You got a rut. It's a nuisance. Could even be a danger. It's unintentionally created. You really just want to get close to your house, right? Now it has no purpose, and now I've got to fix it. On the flip side, a trench is intentionally dug to deliver necessary resources. A trench has a specific, I spelled that wrong, purpose and fixes an existing problem. So this rut that you have has to be replaced with a trench. You want to take the rut, identify what's the number one driving mindset holding you back. What's your rut? And you, I'm not asking you to do it now, just over the next course of whatever, start to think about what's the number one driving negative mindset that holds you back. Now, when you think of that, I would encourage you to write it down. And then nail down a statement that motivates you and inspires you to have hope and change the way you think. So you identified it, you wrote it down, now you're nailing down a statement to replace it, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to train your mind towards a desired truth. You're going to train your mind towards a desired truth. Number one, you write it down. Number two, you think it. Number three, you guessed it, you say it. You write it down, you think it, and then you say it. Until you believe it and focus on it and meditate on it, you got to believe it, you got to focus on it, you got to make it. Remember, this isn't easy. This isn't for the King Ahabs, the winos. Eh, just fix it for me. I don't want to do it. I can't get my vineyard. Jezebel, I can't get my vineyard. This isn't for those kind of people. This is for people who want to grow themselves, who want to become better selves, who want to become more like Jesus, who want to be more like a Christian. Us, right? For those who don't continually refuse the gospel that's being given to them through uh, Obadiah and Elijah and even Naboth. Believe it, focus on it, meditate on it, and it's going to take you time. The struggle in this process is real and it's hard. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we've gathered together to worship you, to edify you, to glorify you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, that it's been brought to our minds that our, our mind is a battlefield, that it's a very uh, uh, precious piece of real estate that you've given us that we need to uh, take care of. Uh, Father, that we know from the Garden of uh, Eden that, yeah, there's some viruses in there, if you will. But, Father, we have what it takes to correct it and to become better people. We have and we know what it takes to grow ourselves to be more like you. So, Father, Holy Spirit, you are our counselor. You're the one that comes alongside of us and teach us and prompt us and bring things to our memory. So, Holy Spirit, we ask, bring just one. Just, just, just one driving negative mindset that's that's holding us back in fact let's just ask you holy spirit tonight or even now bring that one negative mindset that thought that that addiction that what's driving individuals father to to the forefront of their minds and father may they put it in the notes of their phone may they write it down however they need to remember it and then father we say now, as we do that and we start to write, think, and confess, Father, we're going to ask you then, Holy Spirit, to bring us something that brings momentum and motivation into our heart and our spirit of a scripture, Lord, that we can begin to replace that with. Lord, we have ruts in our lives. We have thoughts that have created ruts, and we want to begin to replace those. 
So Holy Spirit, bring those things to our memory. Lord, we do just pray for uh, Pastor Doug and the Pakistan team. God be with them. Father, thank you for the miraculous works that have already taken place, are going to continue to take place. Be with Pastor Doug's father, Father. Lord, sustain him and let him get home. He and Casey be able to visit, Lord. Father, speedily, Lord Jesus, do a mighty work. Lord, we do thank you for your greatness, for the work that you're doing in each and every one of our lives. Be with our folks as they travel home and throughout to the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen. God bless you.